that you would do a miraculous work. That, Father, your name would be glorified. That, Father, we would be able to testify about your goodness, Father God. So we thank you for that, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. So Sarah, uh, Sarah's here this morning. I just wanted to um, uh, honor Sarah this morning. Uh, this is a, a great girl. You know, she uh, works here in the office uh, um, as well. She has two uh, beautiful little girls, and her husband works for Sam. And, um, you know, just at the drop of a hat, I could uh, ring Sarah and ask her if she would preach this week. And, you know, Sarah's always got a word available to share. You know what that tells me? It tells me that this girl is in her word, that she's forever uh, seeking God for something that that he would put on her heart. It's not like she said, oh, look, you know, I need two weeks to go and prepare something. Sarah has it. And, um, you know, she's got two very lively kids, and yet, you know, that she always seems to have an incredible amount of energy, Sarah. And I, I, there are so many times I ask her to do things for me and at the drop of a hat, you know, and she just will immediately start to get it done. And so, Sarah, I just want to honor you this morning. So, church, love you to um, stand. And just um, clap, give Sarah a warm welcome. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, church. It's, it's so good to be back at church. This is my first time back since the whole COVID thing. And um, welcome to some new faces I've seen and some people that have been coming for a while that I met this morning for the first time. <laughs> and welcome to everyone at home who's joining us, um, whether this is your first time joining us or you're from another church. I think everyone's listening for a reason because I'm really excited about um, the word that I have to share this morning. Um, because it's personal to me, um, it's something that God's been talking to me about, and I've seen already so many changes in my life after applying this, and I, I'm expecting way more, and so I'm really hoping to see some, some breakthroughs for you guys, and I hope that this word can be helpful to you. So the title, oh, let's just begin by praying, that's important, Okay. Thank you, God, for this word. Thank you that you have this word in this season for these people, Lord God. And I just pray that their hearts would be open and that you would move and touch and be with every one of them here in this building and at home as they join us. Um, we just thank you that all of this is for your glory, Lord God. All right. So the title, if you saw on Facebook, um, Shelley made me a nice little thingy that goes up and it said and it's called lay it down and I wanted to call it the high places it's going to take you a while to realize why I called it lay it down because we're going to talk a lot about the high places but Asari and I agreed quite random I say high places and you're probably like what on earth that's quite random um, but the problem that I'm going to be talking about is the high places the lay it down is going to come at the end it's how we rectify the problem so why is this important what I'm going to share is important for your growth and your growth in God, um, your relationship with God, especially your ability to lean on him in hard times and to make your anchor sure so that when things hit, your whole world's not just knocked out from under you. Because, you know, the world's pretty crazy at the moment. There's a lot going on. And it's really important more now than ever. I don't think t things are going to get any easier. So we need to be sure that we are deeply rooted in God and rooted in the right things not in things that are going to fail us, okay? So let's just begin with some history. If you're not a history person, just bear with me. It is important. But we're going all the way back to 1250 BC. So the Israelites, they'd been captives in Egypt. They'd been held um, in oppressive slavery there. God had set them free. And then they'd gone into the desert. They'd been walking around the desert for 40 years because, this is just a quick recap, because the generation that had entered the desert didn't believe that they could take the promised land that God had given them. Okay, and then finally that whole generation dies out, the new generation enters the new land, okay? So as they entered the new land, in the desert, God had given them, laid out the ways they were to worship him. He'd been really specific. There was a lot of idol worship around those days um, and worship of other gods, so God had to make it clear how he expected his people were to worship him so that he could 
distinguish himself and his people and differentiate them from, from the people around them, from the other countries around them. Now, the, peop- the other got people, they, had sac- they sacrificed on the heights, which they called the heights, which was high places, hills, um, under trees, um, things like that. And for a season, it, it was all right for the Israelites to worship on the high places. Before the temple was built, to their God and the ways prescribed by God, they could do their sacrifices. Because just for those who don't know um, Judaism very well, so Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism. And Judaism required that you sacrificed an animal. There's lots of different sacrifices, but at least one sacrifice a year for sin atonement per family. So they had to at least do that, but they also sacrificed for other things. So for this time, before they, while they were in the desert and things, and before they entered the promised land, it was okay for them to worship, to, to do their sacrifices wherever they pleased. But now they were entering, they were not nomadic anymore, meaning they were not just wandering around the desert. They now had a fixed geographical location, and they no long, and they now were going to be like a nation in a set place. So things were going to change because that's not how God always intended them to worship. And I'm sorry, I don't have the Bible verses up here today, but if you want to turn to Deuteronomy 12, 2 to 5. So God said to them as they were going in to enter into the promised land, you shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their God and and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God chose out of all your tribes and put his name and make his habitation there. So now Solomon has built the temple. The people are in the promised land. Solomon's built the temple. And so God has made it clear to his people, you are not to worship on the high places anymore. In fact, you are to destroy the high places. Very important. Lots of things went on there with those other nations. They, there was human sacrifice, child sacrifice, idol worship, lots of ho- prostitution and horrible things that went on. So, it, it, there's, I mean, it's quite clear why God wouldn't want them to carry on worshiping him there. But... Solomon, oh well, the people contend, and sorry, I'll just read this also, sorry, Chronicles 32, 12 said, you shall worship before one altar, and on it you shall burn incense. So that now it wasn't anywhere, it was one altar, it was in the temple in Jerusalem, right? Um, Unfortunately, they didn't destroy the high places, and in fact, Solomon even built more high places, um, two other gods. And so the Israelites continued to sacrifice on them. And if you read First and Second Kings, that actually I really enjoy them because I enjoy history. Um, that was like the big problem and the big sort of litmus test of morality of Israel is whether or not the kings destroyed the high places or if, they, um, if the Israelites were worshipping there. So there's only actually two kings that destroyed them, and that was Josiah and Hezekiah, but they both were built up quite soon after. Okay, history part's nearly over. Just There were two. <laughs> so the type of worship that was happening on these high places was two types, actually. There was a cult worship where the Israelites were actually going up there and worshipping other gods. But there was also the Israelites who were going and worshipping Yahweh, their god, um, on these high places, which is not the prescribed way that, um, yeah, that God had asked for. Okay, so... Let's just talk about the occult first. Why would Israel continue to worship other gods after God had been so clear that they were to only worship him and only in this way on this one altar in Jerusalem? The main gods from the nations before were called Baal and Asherim. And they were gods, they were sort of they had different gods for different things. And these gods on these high places were the gods of fertility and agriculture of successful crops and fruit-laden trees and good yield from their animals. This is the things they promised. And so Israel was an agricultural society, meaning 
they, like their whole life was around the seasons and around the harvest and around the growth of their food because they didn't have supermarkets and they didn't have um, big farming outfits and things like that. They all had to grow their own food. So obviously agriculture, very important. So they, it was very attractive to them, these gods that promised these good crops and things. So they would go up there and in the droughts and before their harvests or whatever, and they would worship on these altars and hope that these gods would come through and make their crops good. Unfortunately, God, that in doing this, they were saying, we don't believe that our God is enough. We don't trust our God and we don't think that what he's, what he's got for us is enough or that he can bless our crops. They're putting other gods or idols before their God, which is, makes God very angry. And now you're probably thinking, well, what's such a big deal they're worshiping God on those altars? Well, again, unfortunately, this was not the way that God had prescribed himself to be worshipped. So um, when they did that, it wasn't for God because that's not what God wanted. It was for them. So it was sort of a vain, empty ritual that they would do to tick boxes saying like, yep, we're sacrificing. Um, It might make them feel better, make them feel like they had more control over situations or (laughs) seem... They're ticking their, doing their religious duties when in reality they weren't because otherwise they would go to Jerusalem. If they really wanted it to be for God, they would go to Jerusalem. So it's a vain, empty ritual for them. Now, how does this relate to me? I've read these books a lot in the past because, um, I, I, like I said, I love 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. And I always just read through it and was like, man, Israel were wild. Like, who would worship idols? Like, they had seen all these miracles and they'd entered the promised land and they'd been with God in the desert. And then they still go and worship idols, which was the one thing that God was so hungry about. And I was like, man, I can't relate, like, feeling so righteous. <laughs> but <laughs> last time I read it, I decided to reread them. And God was like, oh, yeah, you, you do have high places, you know. And made me realize, actually, high places might not be just like straight up occultic worship on a hill. Like, I hope none of you are doing that. But um, <laughs> it can be things, yeah, no, um, it can be something in your heart, right? So, um, another word for high places is false refuge. So, can you say false refuge? Yeah, so it's something we run to in times of distress, despair, or discomfort, that something that we invest our hope, happiness, and security in that cannot really ever fulfill those hopes, not without destruction. So let me just quickly tell you what this looked like in my life and what's been going on in my life. Um, it might help you see. So I'm a sprinter, and I am honestly so passionate about athletics, it's bizarre, like I think it's a God-given thing because I'm overly motivated, no one can understand, it's like a rainy day, I've had no sleep with the kids and I'm ringing up my mum going, can you just watch the baby for a second so I can go just do some training and she's like, you're crazy. Um, (laughs) But God's given me a vision for it, Um, he he gave me a dream um, one time. And he's given me some success too. So I've had some good times with athletics. Now, I got pregnant um, just before Rio when I was trying to qualify for Rio. And that was quite, un- I was quite sad about that. Um, but I was like, that's okay. I've got this dream. I've got this thing in my, in my heart. I'm going to hold on to this dream. And I'm going to make a comeback. I'm still going to come back. And nine months later, after having that baby, I got pregnant again. <laughs> Whoops. And then... Um, Anyway, I was like, I'm just going to cling to this dream. And this is where it turned into more than just a, um, just a little dream that God had given me. I literally, through the dark times when things got tough, in my head, I just started going back to my dream. I'm like, it's okay because I'm going to come back from athletics. I'm going to train harder than ever. I'm going to do this and that. And I would just keep visualizing, going over and over in my head. Every time I was running, I'd be like going over and over how I was going to come through in this race and my times and going over and over my goals. And do you know what? None of those things are bad in themselves. The goals, none of it is bad in itself. But what had happened is I actually tied up my identity, my value, my sense of worth and my ability to come back from this athletics thing. And so I'd be running 
going through this, and it had become like a high place for me. It's, it was a place where I was meditating on it and running to it when things got tough to make me feel better rather than to God. And I didn't actually realize that I was doing that. I thought it was fine because, like I say, most things that we do, maybe like a little wine at night or something, they're not bad in themselves. But it's, um, it's when you put your worth, identity, and value, you tie it up in that thing. Or another way things can become a high place is when we continuously turn to it in times of struggle. So we make them our refuge. Life is stressful, and we can do all we can do to kind of get some relief. Um, we can turn to drink, drugs, food, Netflix, a little game on our phone. And, sorry, just one minute. And we just have to be careful that we aren't driven by fear. So different ways that we can, um, we can different examples of high places is say life is stressful, so we like to control things the best we can. We make lists and strategies and methods. We might try and control others just so that we can ensure that things are going to turn out okay for us. Again, if failure, failure shatters you um, to your core or you're fearful of failure, it could mean that you seek meaning, significance, and worth in your success. Um, when you've been hurt in the past and you've got some injuries and you put up walls and push people away and you're like, I'm going to protect myself, I can protect myself, I can do this instead of dealing with it, and your self-protection even can become a high place because you've put your security in that. When we turn up to these other things to give us hope, happiness, and security, we've turned to an idol to give us something that only God can give. God wants us to turn wholeheartedly to him and rely on him. All of these things will let you down. It may not, God will always come through for you. It may not look the way that you expected it to look, but he will always be there and he will never fail you. God wants you to have life and have life in abundance. He doesn't want you to limp through life on a crutch that could be taken out from under you at any moment. That's not life in abundance. And that's not, but that is what, when you lean on these other things, can look like, okay? We have the good news, that is the gospel, that Jesus came and lived and died and can set us free. And through that sacrifice, we can always enter his presence no matter what's going on in our lives, okay? So when things get bad, we can always come to him. When we have done, feel like we've done something bad because of the sacrifice, we can always come to him. And this is, this is the thing. Back then, God wanted, us, wanted them to go to the temple. Now we know our body is the temple, and the altar that he asks us to come before is in our hearts before him. So that's where he's chosen to put his name. Now this is the, this is the kicker here. Okay, God doesn't want you to just stop that behavior or stop whatever your high place is because it's naughty or bad. And he doesn't want you to feel shame about it, okay? He doesn't want you to go to the high places at all or feel the need to go to the high places. He wants you to save you from the emptiness of it all. God looks at the heart. God wants you to bring before him the very things that drive that behavior, he wants you to come before him honestly and say, I'm afraid of failure. I derive my worth and successes from that rather than you, as I had to. He wants us to grow, and to grow, we need to challenge ourselves and ask the hard questions. If you don't know where to start, you could be like David and pray as David did in Psalm 139, 23 to 24. He said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in a way everlasting. So we pray that God will reveal it to us and he'll do that gently, I believe, and without too much condemnation. And we pray that he will reveal um, our high places and things we run to because we might not realize, because I genuinely, I didn't realize that I had them. But what happened was Cornelia and I talk often about what God's talking to us about. And she told me how she, she God was asking her to, like Abraham, brought Isaac to the altar to bring her dreams and everything before God and lay them down. And I was like, well, what would that look like for me? 
And then immediately, it was like it all just dropped on my head. And this is when you know God's given it to you and you know it's something from God. It's like the whole story or the whole picture just drops in your head immediately and you're like, okay, I know the answer. So I felt like God was like, you clinging to that athletic dream, that is a, a high place, that is a dream that you need to lay down. And so I was like, and without even thinking like, but how do I lay it down? I felt like God was like to me, every time in your head you start to go to that place, I want to, you to see yourself laying it down before me and then don't go there. Just, pr- just worship me, praise me. Praise is, your, is the best weapon that you've got against things like this. So now, like, like Isaac, who was Abraham's promise? Abraham's promise for that he was going to be a father of nations. Pretty crazy that God was like, go and kill that promise. But what God was actually doing was he was testing Abraham, as it says. But I think also saying, I want you to trust me that I've got this. That your your trust is not in Abraham and Isaac and not in your son and not in this physical thing or the dream that I've given you, but actually in me. And so now... Every time I go to that place, and with other things too, I mean, I think there's probably more high places in my life that I'll work through slowly. I'm sure we all have them. But now when I get to that place, I actually just, I lay them down and I say, thank you that you have, you have the prom- you have the future, you have it all in your hands, God. And so when we, we start to know what our high place is and how we're going to deal with it, I think it's also really important that we recognize the feelings that drive us to go there. So when we start to recognize the triggers, and this is why. Um, So I I had to realize that it wasn't just an athletics thing, like or like some running thing or some goal thing, because that's not that big a deal in theory. It was actually like a feel of failure or me deriving my worth from my successes. So I had to go back to that and be like, that's not where my worth comes from. That's not where my identity is. My worth and my value and my identity is in God, that I am his daughter, that he has a plan for my life. And so in this, let me tell you another story from the Bible. I actually forgot to write down the the verses, but you just have to trust me that it's in there because it's brief. (laughs) Uh, David had almighty men of war, and it just mentions him briefly. There's one guy it's particularly that stands out to me, and his name is Benaniah. Now, Benaniah is famous, it says, because, was famous at the time, because he was one day walk, out walking, and he was attacked by a lion, and he fought with the lion, and then the lion, he started to beat the lion, the lion ran away and fled and went and jumped down and hid in a pit. Now, most of us would be like, sweet, I won that, and I'd just carry on, like, all good, don't worry about that lion anymore, but no. Benaniah, he followed the lion, and then he jumped down into the pit with the lion, and then he made sure that he killed the lion. And I'm like, that is hardcore. And I feel like that's what we need to do. It's not just, we've got this thing coming up against us, so I'm just going to fight it till it leaves me for now, so that I don't have to deal with it in my immediate present. But I'm going to go down, I'm going to follow it, to where it came from, and I'm going to make sure that I don't have to ever deal with it again. And that is, that is that part of recognizing where the root of these feelings are coming from and dealing with those. Okay, so really (laughs) other things that we can do. So prayer is going to be important through this time. This is going to be a time when you're going through all this where you can't just come to church on a Sunday, and that's just not going to be enough. If you want to deal with these things and make sure that your hope and your anchor is truly in God and you're not leaning on this broken crutch, you're going to need to daily lay it down and you're going to need to daily come before God and deal with it. You're going to need to be, um, what's the word? Like, yeah, like persevere, something like that. Yep. Persistent. Yeah. (laughs) You're going to need to be onto it. Let's just put it that way. You're going to need to be onto it with dealing with it. So when it comes up and when you're feeling tired, You're going to need to pray that God will give you strength to get through and deal with that thing, right? Some of you may need prayer from others, um, and that's fine. Some of you may need counseling, and some of you might have been putting that off. Well, it's time to put on your big girl pants and your big boy pants and go and talk to someone about what's going on. And some of us, I think, can carry a lot of shame around the things that we run to. And 
I just want to encourage you that there's no shame or condemnation in Christ and there's nothing too big. God knows it all. And you can trust that God will deal with you in a way that you can handle. And also that everybody has little things that they run to, probably at some stage in their life. So go and talk it out with someone. Get an accountability partner. But start to deal with these things. I, I just really encourage you, church, because honestly, the growth that I've seen in my relationship with God when I truly actually begin to lean on him is massive. And it's so worth it. And it's so worth the work. So here's your chance. Where I'm going to ask um, the band and stuff to come up, if that's all good. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come up. And if I was talking and you were like, oh, yeah, I've got some high places in my life, either in your seat or come down to the front if you need prayer, now is a chance for you to begin on that journey of dealing with those high places and making sure that your trust and your hope is fully in God, that he is all that you rely on, okay? Cornelia's going to talk a little bit and um, do a little, little, her little altar call. But yeah, you guys are awesome. <laughs> oh, that was just so awesome. Um, I just have some things that are really heavy on my heart that um, I feel God wanting to talk to you guys about this morning. Um, and I also just want to feel him taking us into a time where we would actually repent corporately to know that we're not in this alone. You don't have to hide what you're feeling right now. This is meant to be a safe place, a place of family, a place of compassion and love and Jesus' love flowing out. So I just I want to reassure you, I, I know God is here. I know his angels are here and he's here with you. To not be afraid, to not run away. We can feel these things in our heart sifting up and it, I can feel it. I can feel it in people. It, it, it creates a feeling of sickness and anxiety and, oh, just um, even wanting to throw up. And we sometimes just want to go, you know, no. I just, um, no, you know, this is not comfortable. This does not feel good. I just want to push it down. I just want to push it down. But I want to encourage you that that's not what God wants you to do. He sifted it up for a reason. It's coming to the surface for a reason. Those things coming into your heart right now, it's him speaking them to you. Those feelings that are coming up, they're meant to come up, but they're meant to come out because when they come out, there's healing, there's deliverance, there's change, there's wholeness and purity and that's where God's bringing us to this place of wholeness and purity where we are sons and daughters and we are shining out to the world but when this darkness is sitting in us and we're pushing it down we're not lights we may be by measure so what do I mean like by measure like there's a little there's a part of our heart that is fully submitted to God and in that place we can see fruit and we can see life and we can bring joy to others and healing to others and deliverance. But he doesn't just want that, that part of your heart. He wants the whole entire thing. He wants the whole kit and caboodle. He wants you to be like, I am here for you, for you, God. I'm lifting your name on high. You are more important than this feeling that I'm feeling. You are more powerful than shame and condemnation and fear. You stand, almighty God. I encourage you to lift him up. When you lift him up in awe and you recognize how powerful he is, how mighty and how loving he is, all those things feel small. They feel small. That thing we're clinging on to that we're like, if I tell someone this, they're just not going to look at me the same anymore. They're going to judge me. They're going to talk about me behind my back. They're going to share this with everybody and it's going to be a joke. No. No. Okay, don't stop because of those voices in your head. Don't, don't. I can feel the Lord going, hear my voice, hear my voice. And my voice is filled with love and compassion and mercy and grace and life and light. There's just so much I want to give all of you, all of you, my children. I love you so much. And there's so much that I can't give you because you won't release. You won't lay it down. You won't lay it down, and so I can't give it to you. 
I just want to share an image God gave me um, the other day. I saw him standing outside my window of my house and he was standing there so majestic and so beautiful and his, um, his head was in the heavens. He, and I was just there in awe. I was like, you, I don't even have words to describe the feeling. And then, then he came down. I saw him coming down and I saw him going, get on my shoulders. I, I heard him in my heart going, I'm your daddy and I want you to get on my shoulders. But see, what happens first is we actually need to get on our knees. We need to go, search our hearts, Lord. Search our hearts. And those things that are hidden, those things that we've been pushing down, the hurt, the pain, the wounding, the judgments we're holding on to, the fear, the expectations for what is evil and not good, those things, we need to lay them down. We need to lay him down. And I just want to encourage you. I can hear him just asking you guys to lay it down. Come before me and lay it down. Lay it down. Lay it all down. And I just would like if we could even all together um, pray together, repent together. Um, This is probably not how things usually go, but this is what I'm feeling on my heart. And I just pray that you would have courage and boldness to to do this. And it may just be the start of something. Like Sarah said, this is something we need to do all the time. Every time it comes to the surface, do it again and again. Each new thing until his fullness is is made manifest in us. So, Lord, I just, um, we just come before you humbly. With humble and contrite hearts, we come before you. And we just lay before you the promises you've given us, the dreams, the hopes. We lay before you the wounds, um, the injuries. We lay before you the judgments, um, the expectations. We lay before you our sin. We lay before you our shame. And I just like to say there is no shame. There is no condemnation in Christ. He's not looking at you with a rod of iron to break your back. Um, He's not doing that. I just feel like some people have this image and it's just holding them back of a father, um, even that verse that says, um, spare the rod, spoil the child. And I I just want to break the power of those words over people's lives because that's not what that means. It's protection and guidance. It's not him standing there wanting to punish you. It's protection and guidance. And I know people know that in their minds, but I'm asking you to search your heart. How do you see Lord? How do you see Father? How do you see Holy Spirit? Because he is love. He is love. So we just come before you and we repent, Lord God Almighty. We repent of our sins We repent of all the things that we have done, all those high places that we have turned to for our refuge, for our comfort. Lord, I ask that you would pull down the strongholds, pull down the fortresses of self-protection that we have laid around our hearts, Lord God Almighty. Bring us into healing and wholeness, Lord. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in our hearts and continue to have your way in our hearts. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Lord. I really believe that there is healing and deliverance here for many people this morning. And I just want to encourage you to just take some time to listen to your heart, not your head. Listen to your heart. Listen to what God's saying to you. And um, if you feel led, come up the front for prayer or go to someone that you trust with your heart and you speak to them. Or you go and you spend some time with God and ask him what he wants you to do with the things that he's pinpointed to you. Thank you. And thank you, Lord God Almighty. Thank you for your healing and deliverance. Let's just stand. Can we get the prayer team up, please? I'm going to sing this is amazing grace.
this is amazing grace rain. the power of sin and darkness we love it's mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless, he don't in wonder, the King of glory, the King above all things. This is amazing grace, this is a pain That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for. All that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory. The King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King of all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was dead. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was dead.
So guys, you know, just take some time out this week. Speak with God and just ask Him. Because it's always after the heart. Don't be scared of what He's going to show you. Because I, I heard God say this to me once. I was like, oh, hey, I didn't even know I was there. He's like, you've lived, I've known, and you've lived with that all this time. It's okay. Calm the farm. <laughs> You know, because I was like, oh, my gosh, and I was feeling ashamed and embarrassed. God is beautiful. He knows. He already knows. And it's not a dig dig thing. It's not you trying to find stuff. It's just sitting with God and saying, God, what? What do you want to show me now? What do I need to deal with? It's a beautiful thing. So if you're at home and you'd like some prayer even through the week, please contact the office. We would love to pray with you. Um, we're going to swap drummers now because Manasso has been very patient. He is going to drum. We're going to go out with See the Light. And he'll be on next week for a couple of songs. So let's yeah. sing See the Light with Manasso so he can have a moment on the drums. But I just pray a sealing, Father, what has taken place today. I seal it in our hearts. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to come and show us what you need to show us. We are here for you and ready for change. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. amen. Have a fabulous week, everybody. Take it away. Well, oh, you got it nailed, Manasseh.
Thank you.